previous talk, so if you weren't in the room for it, I'm not going to have room for it. Uh, so, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about me, so you give some framing information and some background. Now I'm going to what Hackathon is, and uh, give you a convoluted and fake example of how to use it for things, and then just then wrap up. Um, so, I work at Science and Technology Facilities Council in the UK, um, in the Scientific Computing Department, and I think we're one of the largest scientific in the world, we have 160 staff. We run lots of big things, supercomputers, high throughput computing, high performance computing, a couple of supercomputers in the top 500, they're worth three, but we've got them at the bottom. Um, I've personally spent about seven years working on with a number of years so I started with the hardware cameras, working out the middleware, and now I'm kind of designing uh, products and installation systems for the whole service. That's, that's my perspective. I realise this is an ABC room, so I'll try and make it a bit as I go along. But I might be lying. So, this has told you about Quattle and what we've had so far. So, it originated from the good work. It originated with most of the development work being done at CERN. What's the use of the project? Can I ask you to speak up? Sure. Um, I'll do my best. Thanks. Uh, I'll just talk louder and louder and louder until you tell me not to. Um, so, most of the original development work for Prattle was done at CERN. Um, they came up with an original configuration management system called CDB. Um, as far as I can work out, C stands for CBS, uh, because that's what the configuration code was stored in. Uh, it was integrated with some of the production systems at CERN for doing inventory and deployment. Um, tried to get used by other people in the community, quickly abandoned it and replaced it with something called SCDB. <coughs> and you can see the pattern version here. Uh, the, and if there were no inventory system packages at all, it's just uh, some ant classes that we need to the hosts and some of the instruction that Louis mentioned earlier. Both of these had scaling issues. So CERN have recently moved away and have switched to Puppet. Um, some of their workflows involved, I believe, something like a two hour wait for a deploy for a change to go out. I think Luis has experienced this first hand at some point. Something like that. Quite honestly, if you're going to be doing that sort of thing, you're going to be doing that sort of Yeah, something really terrible. Um, SDB is what we're running in production at the tier one in the Hamilton laboratory. We've got about 2,500 hosts in it now, and if we want to make things to all it's about 25 minutes, which is starting to become a scaling issue for us. But both of those systems have some of the code, compile, commit, probably repeat, or in some people's cases you code compile, it doesn't compile, code compile, doesn't compile. You go around that circle until someone goes and fixes your problems for you. As I said, neither of them was much more than an environment for writing the pan code in and pushing it out to posts. There's some layout guidelines in the community, um, in particular the QWG template framework, which was um, an effort to try and share configuration, and still is an ongoing effort to share configuration between grid sites and grid. Um, it's a really great way of getting out starting and running, but the lack of any rules or enforced rules for structuring your configuration leads to everyone on the site doing things in a different way. Every site does it differently, and admins within a site do it differently, because of course there's more than one way of doing it right. But what you don't want is one code base with seven different right ways of doing something. What you want is everyone following the same coding guidelines. Now, coders understand working to coding guidelines. This means, at large, in my experience, do not. They find something that works and go with it. So this gets really, really messy. If you start deploying lots of thousands of hosts, you're not going to want to write the code for each host individually, even if it is, this is a host that does this, it has this IP address, and that's all. It gets really boring. So then what starts happening next is every single site designed its own inventory database and some scripts to write the code from that. And again, we ended up with a fragmented community. Now, these are not huge problems. This is still a very powerful system, and everyone was still, and still is, mostly using this. And it's good enough. It's great. It does the job. It's supposed to. But, in 2007, the bank, Morgan Stanley, which Louis alluded to, turned up at one of the community meetings and announced they wanted to deploy 20,000 hosts. Everyone reeled in horror at this because we knew our systems wouldn't scale. And then they added loads of more requirements on top of this. Something 
there, including giving it to people who aren't even cis applicants, their phone line support staff. As in, they sit on a telephone at a help desk somewhere, and someone tells them there's a problem and they need to make a complex configuration thing. Editing pan codes is not going to do this. You need experts involved to do that. Obviously, all of us have been wanting to branch configuration using Subversion or CBS. Branch it, you might not be able to merge it back ever again. And if you're going to start spreading it around hundreds of people, you're going to need to provide and enforce a structure for the configuration. So we need to require something entirely new, which is where Apple came in. So CDPB was the first generation and SCPB was the second generation. This makes Apple on the third generation of configuration management database for Quattle. So it is part of Quattle, which is not a separate thing to Quattle, it is a subcomponent. It does incorporate many ideas from both CDB and SCDB. It re implements some of the things that SCDB dropped from CDB. It also incorporates things from Morgan Stanley's previous configuration management system that they designed in the 90s, which was not designed for Linux at all, it was designed for a few hundred Unix boxes. Um, and luckily for the community, Morgan Stanley did most of the development work, which uh, has been great. They've released everything under the Apache 2 license and it's now part of the project as normal. The first impressions we got were Git. Wonderful. Git is everything we always wanted. Proper branching, proper merging, we can do development without breaking our production systems, which is great. Also, we can give it to new people and they can do development and learning without breaking our production systems. The next thing we decided or discovered was that there's no longer some code, a compiler, and a web server, and it gets pushed out to systems. There's now this thing called Broker whatever that is. It's a demon that owns part of the configuration and writes code for you, which is terrifying the first time you see it. And there's a command line with documented commands and man pages. This was shocking. So the architecture is the little box that you saw on the Lisa diagram if you were this talk, um, which is actually conceptually quite simple, especially when you can see it without all the rest of the mess around it. The pur two purple bits that you have used to in the process is so different, on the right, the AQ client, the client on the left. That is your entire interaction with the system. You write code, you commit it to Git, you ask the broker to do things using client. So when this ends up in something called AQDB, which is a relational database of your choice, but there's only two that we support. It triggers the app to compile, it triggers PAN, it does all the build stuff, it goes out to web servers before. But now you actually have an interface for dealing with it. So this makes things really powerful. The broker really is the source of all power. It provides the workflow that you're missing. It writes you pan code for your objects and relationships. And I'll go on to what an object is in a minute. It owns the Git repositories, and you ask it to do things on your behalf. So, for example, if you want to do some work on a branch, you ask the broker to create your branch. That will then get found out and you may think with a sandbox where you can work on it. You can then attach your hosts, or some of your hosts, just to testing, to your sandbox. So you can now work in a completely isolated environment away from your production systems. You could throw that away at the end if you want to. The work itself is within our life, then it's using SQL Alchemy, which is the most awesome power I might ever come across. Um, as I said, you have a choice of the database system, but we're only support process and all of because those are the only ones we're making upgrades for for. And it has a kind of restish API, which is useful if you want to query it for things. And most of the time, we will recommend using the online hour. So I talked about sandbox which is a minute ago, but they're really, really easy to create, really lightweight. They just get branch that you ask the broker to do it for you. So you use the AQ command. So for example, I create a sandbox called New Awesomeness because I always implement New Awesomeness. And it gets client cloned by the client and set up for you. You can just see the internet start working. When you're finished, or when you want someone else to look at it, you can come and get an upstream code for people. Because we're in Git. We want code for people. We are sysadmins, we want people to tell us what we've done is wrong, don't we? Yes. Absolutely. Then when everyone's happy with it, we merge it back into production. Now, you'll notice on the source here, it has my name before the production merge. This is because Really, someone else should be merging your sandbox back into production, not you. Once someone is happy with it and reviewed it, they should merge your sandbox into production. So, in this case, I'm merging my own back into production because I'm the god, and then everything I write is perfect. I mentioned 
infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. So, Brighton has always been about modeling your infrastructure and your configuration in code. Luis alluded to the fact that sometimes this gets messy and unstructured. So, Acron actually uh, provides parts of your infrastructure as objects. So these are then stored in relation to the database. You can change relationships between them, but things like buildings, rooms, racks, desks, machines, such as routine gateways. These can all be defined using a command line, linked together using the client. The broker then writes the actual hand code for you. You never see it, it's hidden behind the scenes, it's just fed to the compiler at compile time, and everything happens as if by magic. It also implements a few structures for actual configuration. So features which are just blocks of hand code, in fact, as the broker sees them, they are pointed to something you write. This has to be self-contained. You can include other things, and at this point, you'll just back into the platform and do it The personalities is what your machine has. So one machine has one personality. And it's just a collection of features. So you have a web server which requires DNS, HTTPD, PHP, perhaps three different features make one personality called web server, which is what we say is a web server. But that's personal to our site. And the host is just a machine, plus its host name, plus its IP address, a personality, and what operating system it runs. So the whole thing is still designed to be OS version agnostic. So we run a scary number of different versions, point releases of scientific Linux in production with the same configuration trick, because most things that need to be abstracted are abstracted away, things that don't aren't. The command line provides an add a delete and update command for all of these objects and there's a huge help page I'm not even going to show you yet unless we do a demo after this talk. The next part that you can model is services, which is just the concept of a service, the fact that you have servers and clients. But you want to keep track of them, you want to link them with each other. And the real power comes from these things called service maps. So you might have, for example, multiple services at the same time that different types of hosts are connected. So you can define rules based on which ones match which hosts. And I'll give you a convoluted and slightly made up example in a second. But at the moment, you can create those rules based on what organization it is, what physical location it has, and what or what network it is. When we say network IP address, what we mean is the network root IP, so whatever it is, slash 21 or something, for example. So you can allocate a service to a subnet. So, for example, you have two clusters. They both have two different types of compute node, but each has an NFS server, a app server and software to the cluster, which has exactly the same personality because they're just NFS servers. But each is in a separate subnet. What you could do is define an NFS service with an instance of each cluster. It's that simple. Add a server to each instance. Again, everything's simple. This assumes the server's already set up in, in the configuration system. Add the requirement for NFS to both of those you know, personalities. So that is to tell Aqualon that if you have a GPU cluster node or a Xeon Fire cluster node, they both require NFS. As in, you cannot build them without NFS. This is not a valid configuration of this. And then we say, to get those different servers, on those instances, these are the rules for which you have to so if it's in one network, it gets one. If it's in the other network, it gets the other. Okay, that makes sense for us. We can do a demo. So, back to tier one, we were the first site to try and run my back line from understanding. Partly this was because their Unix dev team is based in London. We're based in Oxfordshire. It's just down the railway. If that's even collapses, it's not my fault. So we could get their developers into our office pretty quickly, sort things out. It took about six months of removing all the organisms from their code um, to actually get them to run in the first place. We're now running with about 200 hosts in what we call tree production, which is basically driving a private cloud at the moment, plus some alter names like web servers just to try things out. Um, we're still running SVP in production. The more and more people play with Aquilon, the more less and less they actually want to use SVP anymore. It really feels like the point of comparison. Waiting 10 minutes for something to compile just because you want to check the work. It's, it's not even worth it. So we're getting very close to full migration. Hopefully this year, uh, but with uh, close to 3,000 hosts now, it's going to get better. Carefully. But one of the things we decided.
decided was we had a mess before, we're not going to do a that mess again, so we're going to clean things up and move as we go. And I think uh, you get also doing the same thing, uh, moving slowly and moving things up as we go. So, just to conclude, Acumon is the third generation CMPD fragile. And at this point, as far as the community is concerned, they aren't anymore. So the CMPD are gone. Just keep reusing them, we're not going to support them. You want one, use this. It integrates with inventory information and you can use it as an inventory database. Uh, we're not at the moment, we have a legacy inventory system. We intend to, once we migrate away from SMB, it provides a framework and forces it. And the broker is really the source of the ultimate talent. There's also a solution to all your problems. Now, one thing I didn't mention is because you've got a broker in the command line and the rest of the shape. <coughs> Which gives you more based access and control based on purpose. You can start writing things with other tools. You can start developing something like a platform as a service. Because if you can say this host is now a web server, this host is now a customer, and you can make that change in 30 seconds, and 30 seconds later you can only pick up that change and reinstall it. So you start doing those sorts of funny things. Perhaps one of the problems that came is going to be a very important thing. Not a good food paper. These are all the things that the public web server is made out of. So the personality is it's an external web server, and it has a web server daemon, and that's it. Because it's part of our site, it also gets all these various things like DNS and LDP and SSID tools and the message of the day. Important. So every single person we have gets them. So everything about it, but it's not actually a real machine, and it's a kind of fake building. So it's currently a web server. Let's make here a nice search name. So this is the sort of thing that um, a help desk or even a, a user could have if you want to make some kind of platform to service kind of thing. This could go 
care about the wrong the record, I didn't ask you to break it. <laughs> 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 yeah, so that node is now becoming an elastic search node. So I should probably undo that for 20 minutes. That means the web server will probably get uninstalled for many minutes and elastic search will start up in the front trust. But yeah, so for a help desk user, they can do that and fix the user's problem pretty quickly. Really, they shouldn't be changing the personality of the server. So what you've got to is you can still break things, but not for stupid reasons like syntax errors yes, or whatever. Because the compiler sits there and verifies all your profile information up front. You have that information before you've gone and broken everything. So instead of, I, the way I think of it, instead of moving past the breaking things, you're moving past the not breaking things, which is probably better. Is, does it support something like roles? So you can say you're a help desk user? Yes, know. yes. So, so the, we don't have any roles set up because we're all power users and we trust everyone, right? Um, so the, the roles are based on what commands people can run. So you might not want anyone to be able to make network commands, for example, because you might have a networking team who does that. You might not want people to be able to change personalities if they're in a certain sub team or if they're in support. But you might want them to be able to add features and remove features from existing so It's up to you to define what the roles are. At the moment, they're coded in Python, so you have to put the Python module in to change the roles, but I believe they're not going to have a problem at some point soon. The development is moving scary fast because there's a big team of developers keeping it going from what it's done. And we're putting a request into them and then it's not very fun. That's good. <coughs> I don't think they'll have other machines. You can just treat the machines as any type of managed machines. Um, and in terms of using it to trigger the generation of the VMs, no, I don't think there has been any work there. I know that Morgan Stanley are looking at how to go down to this. At the moment, what they've done though is focus purely on things like VMware. So they are merging this stupid number of VMware. Clusters and machines. So, one of the concepts it has built in is the idea of a cluster of VMware machines, machines around the machine so, And there's another demon that works alongside that kind of